Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Olfers. Would you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. My name is Ronald Olfers. My DOC number is 517082. <clears throat> Olfers, uh, you're here this afternoon seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in the 22nd Judicial District, St. Tammany. November 2006, you received a life sentence for second-degree murder. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Let me just acknowledge the folks who have joined us today. Uh, we have Andrew Hundley with the Parole Project. We have uh, some family members, John Olfers, Daniel Olfers, Lori Olfers, uh, Daniel Olfers, and Ron Olfers. Uh, and speaking on your behalf will be Lori and Ron. We'll call them at the appropriate time to do. Uh, we also have joining us uh, by phone, Ms. Linda Roy, um, who is representing the victim and we'll call on her at the appropriate time also. Uh, your case this afternoon, Mr. Olfers, has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson, seated to my far left. Would you answer her questions, please? Good afternoon, Mr. Office. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing fine. I am a little hard of hearing and I'm, I'm having a little I'll difficulty. Try to speak up, okay? okay? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. How old are you, Mr. Alfred? I'm 70 years old. And how much time have you served in this case? Uh, uh, um, for time will be 17 years. Um, and the victim in this case was your second wife. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, tell us what happened to her. Basically, 27 years ago, I did something that was unimaginable. I caused the death of my wife. How did you cause the death of your wife? She and I, she drowned behind our house. Uh, we were having some mar uh, marital problems. And we started talking about where our marriage was headed. And it escalated into an argument. We grabbed each other and we fell into the waterway. And at that time, I didn't realize that she stopped struggling. And I, and you what? Huh? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. So your story today is that you all were struggling and you both fell into the water and she drowned. Is that what you were saying today? Yes, ma'am. Um, so why didn't you pull her out of the water? Because I knew I, I did. I, I held her. I I looked up. I looked up and I said, Debbie, I love you. And I held. I held her. And I, I was, Why didn't you pull her out of the water? We were. She was dead. She was cold. Her arms were cold. All I could do was. Oh, her and call oh, her. 
you and she fell into the water at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Why would she be cold? Why would her body be cold? Why would she be dead? Why did you go out of the water after the two of you fell into the water? Uh, we were struggling and I, I was holding her. I didn't realize I was holding her under the water, but I was. And because what you're saying is making no sense to me. I'm sorry. I said, what you're saying doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What, then if, if this was some accidental drowning, why did you call the police? and report her missing when you knew all the while she was down at the dock. Why did you do that? I couldn't admit to myself that I had done something so terrible. But, it, but you haven't told us the terrible thing that you did. I'm sorry, Ms. Jackson. What is the terrible thing that you did? I took her life. How? By drowning her. Intentionally? No, not intentionally. I did not do that intentionally. Right, Ms. Um, this, is, this is like the third story that you told about this. First, you called the police and you reported her missing. Yes, ma'am. Then when they came, you, you know, kind of got them down to the dock to look down there and you found her in the water and According to the police report, you then, you know, went in the water and you pulled her out. And um, the um, cause of death or the manner of death was undetermined. And then when the case was reexamined and it was ruled to be a homicide, you told a different story that you uh, were struggling. You pushed her into the water and you never said anything about you being in the water with her. You pushed her. She fell in the water as part of the struggle. And then uh, you left her there in the water. Ms. Ms. Jackson, I was ashamed of myself. I couldn't admit to myself what I had done. I couldn't, I didn't want to admit to anyone what I had done. And you're not admitting, Ms. Olin, you're not admitting to anyone today what you've done. The yes, car, coroner's uh, examination that took place, um, I think in 2002, found evidence of, you know, blunt force trauma. That would have been inconsistent with someone falling the short distance. I'm just reading more I, I don't uh, honestly don't know how she got the head injuries that she had. That she had two or three bruises on her head. Um, and, and she could have hit her head on the bulkhead when we went into the water. I don't know. I have no okay. idea. Okay. Um, what was this business about her taking $70,000 from an elderly person, running off to Miami with another man, running out of money, and then coming back to you and you took her back? Why would you say something like that? It was the truth. Uh, I'm not sure who I told that to, but um, it was the truth. And then you told him that somebody told you she had been arrested 27 times. I mean, it seems like you were doing everything in your power to paint her in a negative light. No, it wasn't that. Every, uh, my, my, my previous wife, Debbie, well, I wasn't going to talk very much about your previous wife, but she was also murdered in your home in 1979 in an apparent burglary attempt. 
a gentleman was convicted of that crime and served 34 years in prison and was ultimately exonerated and found not to have been to have been innocent of the charge. So somebody uh, served 34 years in prison for killing your first wife for a crime he did not commit. Yes, ma'am. You know, it's very unusual for a person to have two wives for them to both end up dead in acts of violence. That's kind of, um, you know, concerning to me. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, you have opposition in the case from the DA, uh, the uh, sheriff's office, the victim's sister. On the other hand, you do have uh, a lot of support from your family, from uh, a lot of people involved in the reentry program. Uh, your risk is low. You've only had, uh, you've had no write-up uh, whatsoever. You participated in a lot of programs. Um, tell us about programs that you've been most active in, Mr. Alpers. Uh, I'm sorry, programs what? That you've been active in. Uh, what? Program that you've been active in. Uh, getting it right, inside, outside, dad, um, financial planning. Um, a lot of, uh, the majority of the programs with the reentry program that I'm involved in, um, up until uh, two years ago, I was teaching a bunch of the classes, but I, I came down with cancer. And um, so I had to cut back on a lot of my teaching. The only class I teach at this time is the, the financial planning class. And you have been a police officer for some point in time, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And the police officer at the time of the second wife's uh, death? No, oh, ma'am. Um, why were you no longer with the police department? I had uh, cancer back in 1986 also, and I took a disability pension. And that was not related to the death of your first wife? There was not nothing brought up and you terminate? You were terminated. You have to appeal to get your job back. You don't get terminated for cancer. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you said. I said you were terminated because of the events surrounding the death of your first wife. Yes, ma'am. And you ended up appealing that um, dismissal and you were successful, um, but you were not terminated because you had cancer. You were terminated because of suspicions uh, revolving around death of your first wife. Isn't that correct? In other words, I was terminated in um, 79, I believe it was, for possession of stolen property, and that was involving my first wife. I was reinstated. The uh, detective basically uh, stated at the civil service hearing that my termination was just to put pressure on, on me because of an investigation of the death of my wife. Is they I, suspect that you have been involved in the death of your wife? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, my understanding of the higher up rank did from what I was told. But I was reinstated. And um, I guess about five years later or whatever, I came down with the cancer. And they uh, wanted me to take a disability, which I took. Uh, you have a number of letters uh, of support, uh, including people from uh, your family, 
the reentry program, some of the reentry mentees. Well, I've spoken well of you. Um, Warren Ambo, what can you tell us about Mr. Alfred's? Um, Mr. Alfred has taken a plethora of classes. Uh, he also has facilitated uh, Inside Out and Getting It Right. Uh, he participated in Tyro Leadership. He's one of the lead social mentors. Uh, he's very dependable in that uh, area, and he sets a good example for the mentees. Um, he's a minimum A trustee that works at a, as a mentor in the Ranger Court uh, program. Thank you, um, Warren Ambo. Mr. That's all I have. Just one question. All right. Mr. Rocher. Uh, Mr. Alvarez. Yes, sir. Alvin Rocher, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are okay. you doing? I have one question. At the time of your first wife's death and your second wife, both of those individuals were on, in the process of divorcing you. Is that correct? I wasn't aware that my first wife was until after her death. Uh, my second wife, uh, we were talking, uh, you know, about where our marriage was headed. So both of those, both of those individuals were in the process of divorcing. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I, I would say that's correct. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions, so we'll go to the support. Mr. Hunley with the Parole Project. Uh, Andrew Hunley, Louisiana Parole Project. <clears throat> Appearing to the board today to inform you that if Mr. Ulfers is released, our organization will provide him reentry support into the community uh, based on his outstanding disciplinary record in prison. Uh, what he's done as a reentry mentor um, and his, his low risk level. We have a high degree of confidence in his ability to reenter the community and, and to, to be a good member of the community. He has given a lot uh, to his local community at Angola, helped a lot of young men uh, rebuild their lives on the inside. And uh, we hope to give him the opportunity to do the same one day in the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Lori Alfers? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm Lori Alfers. I'm married to Ron Jr. I met Ronnie and Debbie 27 years ago and two months ago. So I didn't know them together very well. I spoke to Debbie quite a bit on the phone. And, you know, when all of this happened, you know, of course, Ronnie didn't tell us, but, so he couldn't tell us, you know, of course, we what he had done. And, um, you know, but um, these four guys are victims. All my girls are victims. He knows that. And he, I have seen, I mean, we have the word with this, but I've seen real sincerity from him. You know, he is, I can honestly say, I mean, because it took me a long time to come around. And my girls, well, honestly, they didn't even know. They thought he worked for the CIA because my husband wouldn't tell them, but it happened to me. So they, um, but they have forged a relationship and they love him and we all love him. And I can promise you, you know, I keep hearing from supporters that he is a, you know, a low risk offender, a low risk offender, but definitely offended the court. He offended our community, he offended the state, he decides. But this man has made tremendous breakthroughs. If he's given the opportunity, I definitely see him leaving a much better man 
a better father, a better grandfather, a better friend. And when we go to visit him at Angola, I was amazed because he's a quiet man, you know, so, but he's had lots of people that walk up and hug him and they tell us about the great things that he's done for them. And, you know, and I just, I believe he's worthy. I believe he's worthy. Okay. All right. Thank you for calling me first. I really couldn't steal any of my notes. <laughs> I'm Ron Jr. Um, I was actually okay. the last person to speak to them. Um, she was mentioning my mother because um, she raised us since I was feeling with brothers too. Um, my daughter uh, was always at their house. Um, so, um, you know, we lost all of that. Um, after it all occurred, um, I supported my father, uh, who was my father. And then eventually, when um, he came clean to us, um, that he was the cause of, uh, of Deb's death, um, I went um, right after four years when I was speaking to him at all. Um, and then one day, my, my, uh, my three daughters wanted to go see him. And uh, so I was against them going to see him. And uh, Lori talked me into giving my blessing for them to go see him. And then, uh, but I, I said, I'm absolutely not going. Um, the night before, I, I decided I didn't have to go there. Um, without the song. And then, um, ironically, at one point, all of them got up and had to go to the bathroom and my son there with my father. Um, so after quite an extended period of silence, he started talking and, um, and uh, then they came back. And at any rate, that started me starting to um, go see him again um, and speak to him. And uh, the man that um, that I knew prior to that, and the man that's um, there today is um, a different individual um, in reference to empathy and um, just there's no arrogance there. There's there's none of that. Um, he's also a very sick man. Um, I don't expect him to actually probably live another couple of years. Um, he's at the point now to he can't walk from wherever his dormitory is to the to the uh, to go eat um, without taking two or three breaks, or at times having to get um, in the wheelchair. <clears throat> Basically, it's hard to get him out. So uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know the, the um, with the time frames it's become to eventually get out. But I know from a health perspective, he's uh, he's definitely at the end of his life, and certainly. Not a threat to anybody because he can't even barely, you know, perform the functions that he needs to do every day. Um, we obviously are not opposing it, but we're victims. I mean, my, you know, like Lori said, you know, I knew from, I knew from a kid for um, just because I didn't want them to have that burden. Um, and obviously, my brother and I, um, you know. Uh, Lost the second mother um, and the father. Um, I, tell you, I, I had nothing to do with the man uh, for years. I mean, he would call the house. Um, I, I wouldn't. I would answer the phone. I would take the calls. I wouldn't. My children and no worry. Um, but uh, I do believe that um, hopefully he um, it's an opportunity. Um, to uh to be that um, if he does um from a uh where he would stay what have you is uh we have a um a second house on our property um where you know he would stay it was on uh, before Lori's mother died we had that for her and that's where he would move in 
and um, live by us. And, uh, so that's it. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, now we have Ms. Um, Linda Roy. Ms. Linda, are you there? We'd like to hear from you now. Okay. Is that what I want to say? Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, I don't feel like Ryan deserves to be out. Of his shell. I don't like he wants to do. I don't like he feels like no one. He's free. He's going at himself. My sister cannot be brought back from the dead. Thank you, Ms. Roy. We do appreciate your participation. And I see we have the district attorney's office has joined us. Would you like to make your statement? Mr. Clark? Yeah, yes, I, I don't think I could hear you earlier. Okay, we're ready for your statement. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman Brian Clark, on behalf of the 22nd Judicial District Attorney's Office. Uh, my office in this case is opposed to Mr. Ulfer's pardon. Uh, this all, uh, crime involves a particularly brutal murder of an individual with a history of domestic violence, especially against this particular victim. Very cold and callous nature of the case. Um, there also seems to be a very much of a uh, distinct lack of remorse on a part of Mr. Alpers, especially his characterization of how the murder itself happened, the victim simply falling into the water and him walking off. Given the nature of this offense, the nature of the crime, 
uh, Mr. Alford's history, including with his victim, and a lack of remorse or taking responsibility for this offense, the state would oppose any pardon in this case. All right, um, Mr. Alford, is there a brief statement you'd like to make to the board before we vote? I'd like to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to come before you. On September 20th, 1996, was the worst night of my life and something I re relive all the time. I could have never imagine doing something like I did. I wish I had the words to say sorry, how, how, how sorry I am for my wife, Debbie, her sister, Lynn, her father, Raymond. My actions caused so much pain for so many people, not only Debbie's family and friends, but my family and friends. It's caused pain for people I don't even know. Words cannot express the sorrow and regret I have. I may not deserve the opportunity to start over, but I'm asking the board to give me a chance I have support from friends and family, <clears throat> the support of warden and staff and my church group. I'm just asking the board to please give me the chance to start over, to do the things right. Thank yes, you. sir. Sir, thank you. I think uh, we are prepared to vote. Mrs. Jackson will vote first. Huh? Mr. Alfred, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Mr. Alfred, I acknowledge that you've done some really good things while you've been incarcerated. You've impacted the lives of other uh, inmates who have uh, been able to uh, transition to a better life than before. And I don't discount in any way the good things that you have done during the course of your incarceration. But for me, uh, 16 and a half years uh, for a really heartless crime is insufficient. And it's ironic that the man who was wrongfully convicted of killing your first wife spent 34 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And you've only spent, you know, less than half of that for a crime that you did commit. And I just don't feel like the amount of time served in light of all of the circumstances of, of your case is sufficient um, to warrant uh, a commutation. Mr. Roche. Madam Chairman, my vote is the same for the same reason. Mr. Mirabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Alfers, uh, you have done a lot of good things while you've been in there, but uh, I agree with Judge Jackson. It's just insufficient amount of time. Uh, I think you need uh, a little more work. Uh, good luck to you. My vote likewise is to deny. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I concur with my colleague. My vote is to deny. All right, Mr. Alfers, you've received four votes to deny your application for clemency. So today, sir, your application's been denied. Good luck. Thank you. I appreciate your time.